You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme... You wait years for an electric car announcement and then two come along at once. Vauxhall's parent company follows Nissan in confirming plans to switch its Ellesmere port plant to manufacturing electric vehicles. But could hydrogen cars be the new kid on the green vehicle block? I'll be speaking to presenter and proud hydrogen car owner, James May. And how communities around the UK will be marking the great big green week ahead of the COP26 climate summit. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. Well, last week it was Nissan. Today it is Vauxhall's turn. The car manufacturer's parent company is the latest to announce a switch to electric vehicles, confirming that their Ellesmere port plant, which currently produces the Astra model, will change to making electric vans. And with new figures today showing that more than one in ten new cars sold last month were electric, it seems like consumers are starting to drive the change. Our business correspondent Paul Kelso has more. This announcement is big news for electric vehicle production in the UK because it concerns the production of vans and their passenger derivatives like these. There's a Peugeot brand, we have a Citroen brand here and this is the Vauxhall Combo E and it's significant because these are the kind of small vans that do so much home delivery now with the rise of e-commerce and moving that huge fleet from diesel and petrol vans to electric vans is going to take the UK a significant step down the road towards minimising emissions. Uh, now the plant here has been here for 60 years, they've always made internal combustion engines, that will end. They're also looking to produce all their power sustainably from uh, solar and wind farms on the site. They're also going to take the opportunity to shrink this plant a bit to make it much more efficient. They reckon they can reduce the time it takes to make one of these by 60% just by bringing everything closer together and that will make this a more efficient and hopefully a greener place to make vehicles. Well, electric cars aren't the only eco-friendly alternative on the market. Hydrogen cars are also being developed across the UK and they could be an option fit for royalty. Today, Prince Charles visited River Simple in central Wales. It's a company manufacturing hydrogen cars. But how do they differ from electric options? Well, they're powered by electricity produced internally through chemical reactions between hydrogen and oxygen. They emit no carbon. Water is the only tailpipe emission. And while electric batteries normally take several hours to recharge, hydrogen is dispensed much more like petrol or diesel in minutes at a filling station. But the infrastructure is currently very limited, with only 11 hydrogen filling stations in the UK, nearly half of which are inside the M25. And as hydrogen doesn't exist in its pure form, the production process is energy intensive and often requires using fossil fuels. And when manufacturing is taken into account, a hydrogen vehicle will produce around 120 grams per kilometre of carbon dioxide over its lifetime. Although if the hydrogen is produced using renewable energy, that figure could be reduced significantly. Well, that compares to an electric vehicle at around 124 grams per kilometre, most of which comes from the production of lithium-ion batteries in the cars. Well, joining me now is the presenter and hydrogen car owner, James May. James, good to talk to you. I know that you're a man who likes his motors, so my first question to you really is how is the ride different? Um, well, I, I, I should come clean and uh, have a hydrogen electric car and a battery electric car because I'm uh, comparing them in the real world and I'm trying to take part in the experiments. I'm not an evangelist for either. I'm keeping an open mind. But in both cases, because they're both essentially electric cars, the experience is uh, quiet, serene and uh, polite is the word I often use because I can drive them very early in the morning, which I often do, and I don't wake people up. So um, I'm a big fan of electric motoring, but I think 
both, both solutions, hydrogen and batteries, are fraught with potential problems. The problem for batteries is the mining of the difficult materials, um, very unclean mining, the fact that they're still taking a long time to charge and there's no obvious battery development on the near horizon. Um, the problem with the hydrogen car is it refills quickly, but it's very difficult to find the hydrogen. It's very difficult and expensive to produce clean hydrogen. Most of it at the moment is, is grey hydrogen made by reforming fossil fuels. Um, as you say, if we use it with sustainable energy, it will become perfectly clean. But it's also not very energy efficient, but then maybe that doesn't matter. It's, it's a massively complicated subject. Batteries are unsuitable for things like aeroplanes because the batteries we'd have would be enormous and unworkable. So I, I think there's actually room for battery and hydrogen cars in the future. Battery cars are great if you can charge at home. If you're not a massive user, you know, we know the statistics, most people only drive short distances, eight miles a day, and they can recharge overnight if they have somewhere to do it. The advantage of the hydrogen car is, is more that it's not a solution for the car, it's uh, the car take on a bigger energy picture, which is a hydrogen infrastructure and a hydrogen economy. So it would really be put in place for things like ships, aviation, heavy haulage, and the car would benefit from it. The car as it is benefits massively from the battery revolution, but it doesn't transfer so well to things like haulage, shipping and aviation. This is why I think we'll end up with both and maybe some other things besides. James, you described it as a polite drive. Now, you're a man who likes, I think, the thrill of a drive. Is the most exhilarating thing about driving a hydrogen car is not knowing when perhaps you're going to find the next hydrogen filling station? Well, I, yes, I do get a perverse thrill out of that because there's a bit of brinksmanship involved. Um, and I, yeah, I do, I do enjoy it. I, I have a very good mental picture now of where the hydrogen filling stations are. I am in London, so I'm in a, in a lucky position. I've got two within a few miles of my house. And on regular journeys I make, I know how far I can go before I'm out of range of the hydrogen filler. There's nothing you can do if you run out. If you run out in a battery car, you can push it to a plug and you can plug it in anywhere. You can't do that with hydrogen. So, yes, I do enjoy that. Um, my new hydrogen car, I've just got the new Toyota. Um, it's got a bigger tank and a bigger range and it's a bit more efficient. And I find I'm a little bit more relaxed about using it. But there are still parts of the country where if I'm going there, in all honesty, I have to take the Ferrari. It's as simple as that. <laughs> you poor man, my heart goes out yeah. to you. Um, 2030, there's going to be a ban on sales of petrol and diesel cars. Do you think we'll be ready and will hydrogen be a part of that mix? Um, I hope hydrogen will be a part of that mix, certainly for those other areas I mentioned, like vans, big lorries and so on. Um, I, I think... I think we can be ready, but I think some of the challenges are bigger than people are wanting to admit. So with everybody says there's only eight and a half thousand or slightly fewer than eight and a half thousand petrol stations left in Britain these days. The number has been declining since the 60s. But what they're forgetting is most of them have at least five. Some of them have 20 pumps and they're occupied for a few minutes at a time. Whereas battery cars, even with really good supercharging networks, still take tens of minutes, sometimes an hour to recharge. So even though we've got more charging points than petrol stations, I don't think it's anything like enough yet, because if you multiply the number of pumps at a petrol station and then multiply that again by the number of minutes you need to occupy an electric charge, you, I, I worked out the other day that the country needs something like 1.2 million. So it's not going to be for everybody. And if you are traveling the country selling encyclopedias or any of those other things that people drive around doing, then it's, it's going to be tricky to use a battery electric car and a hydrogen car would be nicer if there were the filling stations. I filled mine up uh, two days ago and I timed it out of interest, which I do fairly regularly because I'm that kind of bloke. Uh, and it took four minutes and 10 seconds. And that gave me a range of 300 miles. And that is glorious. Really good to talk to you, James May. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in today's other climate news, and Mexico's state-run energy firm Pemex says there's no environmental damage from a fire near one of its oil platforms. The company says the quick actions of its workers controlled the fire in the Gulf of Mexico, but environmentalists say that it's too soon to know if the fire caused any damage. It's thought that the blaze began after a gas leak occurred in an underwater pipeline that connects to one of Pemex's platforms. 
A new record high temperature has been registered in Lapland. The 33.6 degrees Celsius reading was taken in Kivo on Sunday, the hottest day since 1914. Finland is one of several Nordic countries to experience record temperatures over the weekend. Scientists say these conditions are linked to the extreme heat wave and wildfires seen recently in North America. The French Senate has voted to block a referendum to add climate protection to the Constitution. Conservative MPs said the proposal is unnecessary and could harm the country's business sector. President Macron has promised to organise the vote after he was criticised by members of his own party for not doing enough to protect the environment. And a herd of elephants is being taken from Kent to Kenya in the first rewilding project of its kind. The Aspinall Foundation will fly 13 elephants currently living at Howlett's Wild Animal Park more than 7,000 kilometres across the world to Africa. The charity hopes it will encourage the zoo industry to take part in similar projects, returning animals to the wild. Now, the UK's development finance institution has investments worth more than £650 million in fossil fuels overseas. Boris Johnson has pledged to end government direct support for the sector. So what is going on? Well, our climate correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter, is here. Hannah, how does the government justify this kind of investment? Well, this investment institution is called the CDC and it invests UK government aid overseas in Africa and South Asia. And it is actually allowed to invest in particularly gas-fired coal, uh, gas-fired power plants uh, in order to support development. Uh, that's part of a set of government uh, exemptions. But there are campaigners who say, well, what the CDC is doing is nonsense. It shouldn't be supporting fossil fuel development anywhere in the world on behalf of the UK taxpayer. It is locking developing countries into long-term reliance on fossil fuels when it should be doing uh, the opposite. And, and gas isn't a clean bridging fuel at all. It will stop the world uh, getting to its net zero carbon emissions by 2050 targets, which we've, we've heard so much about. But then if you speak to people within the CDC, CDC, they will say, first of all, we're not doing anything wrong. This is all within government guidance. And secondly, there are hundreds of millions of people in Africa, for example, who don't have access to the electricity and therefore the modern world. That constitutes an acute development need. We have a responsibility to meet that need. And it has to be perhaps balanced with this march to renewables, which is absolutely necessary, but not really that straightforward. And what's interesting about this story is it illustrates how complicated and thorny this issue is very clearly indeed. Doesn't it just? Hannah, thank you. Now, what will you be doing in the run-up to COP26? Well, if you haven't decided yet, then don't panic because plans for the great big Green Week have just been announced. It will take place ahead of November's climate conference and will include events such as concerts, litter picks and nature walks to show how communities are taking action to fight climate change. Well, thousands of people have already signed up and among them is actor and WWF ambassador Kel Spellman, who joins me now. Uh, Kel, good to talk to you. Tell us a little bit more about the great big Green Week, if you would, and, and what you'll be doing. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be on the show. I'm a big fan of the show. You're one of a few shows that's putting climate and the environment on mainstream television, which is great. Um, well, the great big green week, listen, this hopefully is going to be one of the biggest weeks centred around climate and the environment and nature uh, that we've seen here in the UK. Um, you've said it there as well. Of course, we've got a bigger conference taking place, COP26 come November. So this is a chance, I think, for really the, the country to come together and, you know, get us talking about nature, getting us talking about what we can all do individually, what we can do as communities, but also, you know, show politicians and show the, our government and, and world leaders around the world that we as a country and the people of this country uh, really want to see some ambitious commitments taken at COP uh, because we care for, we love for and want to nurture our environment and protect our nature here at home and around the world. And I think this is going to be a real special week where if we can have everybody talking about it, everybody feeling things around kind of the environment and our, our local environment around us, I think it could be really, really special. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Because the majority of the public, according to a survey, think that the government really needs to up its game ahead of COP26. 
Yeah, and I, and I think that seems to be growing, um, you know, month month on month, really, for me. I think really, especially over these last 18 months, we've seen us all kind of find a new love and appreciation for nature like never before. And as we find that love and appreciation for it, with that comes understanding. And what people are really starting to understand, and I think it has finally hit home, is there is a, a real finite amount of time we've got to turn things around and we can all do our own things individually, of course, but some of the big ambitious things that we need to see, unfortunately, has to come from our government. And when you look around at what has the government done, you know, pledging is one thing, but action is another thing. It doesn't seem to add up. And given the severity of the situation, and I don't want to be doom and gloom because it's not what I'm about, but we are at a very critical time and we are at a real tipping point. And if we don't turn things around very quickly, we are going to go past the point of no return. And I think we're looking to the government and say your actions and what you're saying doesn't seem to correlate with just how much of an emergency this is. And we're all trying to do our bit. Um, we just need to see a little bit more from uh, our politicians and world leaders all around the world. Cal Spellman, good to talk to you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that is everything from us for today. On The Daily Climate Show tomorrow, how rewiggling rivers can help to reduce flooding and improve habitats. That's at the same time tomorrow here on Sky News. Thanks for watching.